great to be here at Fort Ticonderoga, and I must say to everyone uh, out there who's watching, this is a place to bring your family. This is real American history, hands-on. Everyone should come here at one time in, in their American life and see how it all began. When I was a kid in school in Chicago, uh, I learned three things about the War of 1812. I learned that Dolly Madison, the wife of the president, had saved George Washington's portrait uh, before the British burned the White House. I learned that Francis Scott Key had written the poem while watching the, the British bombard Fort McHenry, which later became the words to our national anthem. And I know that uh, Andrew Jackson uh, commanded uh, American forces at New Orleans and fought the British uh, after the war was over. Other than that, I had no knowledge at all. But today, I think that that may be about the same amount of knowledge that's across the country. The War of 1812 has just slipped into oblivion. And so we're going to try to correct that uh, a little bit today. And so in about 40 minutes, I'm going to do the War of 1812 and its alternative. Uh, so this is going to be history on horseback. We are really going to go fast. And if, uh, when I miss things, uh, and I will do <laughs> deliberately, uh, I hope that you can bring them up and question those things that are really uh, interesting uh, to you. But first of all, everyone says, what are the causes of the War of 1812? And the causes of the War of 1812 really find their origin with Napoleon and Napoleonic Wars in Central Europe. They really start in earnest about 1795 when Napoleon begins to conquer all the nations of Europe, and he does so with rapidity. Uh, for a number of years, and uh, this causes the British across the English Channel a tremendous amount of trouble because they have to trade. They must be in Europe in order to survive. They have to trade with them, and uh, they've been excluded uh, by the French. And so uh, they've decided that they have got to get into this war that the Prussians, the Russians, and the Austrians have been fighting and losing uh, up until uh, uh, 1804 or so when there's a bit of a truce for a little bit, bit of time. And the British now take it really uh, to heart. And they themselves finally put together a large army. Uh, and they go to the aid of Portugal. And uh, commanding there in their uh, later campaigns, there's Wellington, the Duke of Wellington. And he will become victorious uh, as, the, as the years uh, grind uh, on uh, in the Peninsula Wars. At the same time, the British have got a naval problem, an enormous naval problem, because you know, they, they need those colonies, and they need that trade from all over the world. And it's the British Navy, the Royal Navy, that keeps those supply lines open. Well, the French Navy is out there disrupting that as well. And so that's causing them terrific trouble. So the, so the Royal Navy has got to expand in order to support the homeland. And in order to do that, they're going to go up to 600 Royal Navy combat ships. That's an awful lot of ships, particularly in that day. It's an awful lot of ships today of combat nature. And so... The British, though, have a tradition. After about mid-1600s, the British, whenever they went to war, they always uh, went to the, to the people and got their crews. When I say went to the people, they just went and, and took them. Uh, they, quote, impressed people on the street, people coming out of pubs, uh, people in British ship, merchant ships coming into port. And uh, before the ship would enter port, for instance, at Portsmouth, a British man of war would stop, a boarding party would go on, and they would pick the most healthy uh, seamen and take them off and put them on a British man of war. And that's where they stayed until the war was over. And of course, the War of, 18, uh, of R1812 will go on for a number of years. Some of these people will be on there for eight and nine years. Many of their families didn't know where they were. Well, it didn't just happen to the British. As things went on, the British expanded that. And they knew that America was making a killing by trading with all of the countries of Europe to include the British because we were a neutral nation. They began now to, to violate that neutrality. And to do so, uh, they stopped our ships at sea. Uh, they embargoed our, our, our cargoes. Uh, they took ships. Uh, they blockaded American ports. And most importantly, from Thomas Jefferson's standpoint, who was president of the United States at this time, they were actually taking a merchant seamen off ships and, and putting them into the Royal Navy and there to spend the, the duration of the war. Now, there were about 100,000 American seamen working on merchant ships at that time. We really were a maritime nation because, you know, we're only an eastern seaboard nation in, uh, in the early 1800s. We've only been really operating since, as, as a country since about 1804, or, uh, 1794. So 
Well, we've got uh, these, these guys who are really keeping our lifeblood going, and now 10,000 of them during the entire duration of this war will be taken by the British, forced on board British ships, and forced even to fight against American ships, their own countrymen. So this is a very, very serious thing. So, uh, but this is the only way the British can man their fleet, and that doesn't really upset uh, England because it's, quote, traditional. Uh, I, I'm not too sure about that when it comes to the people, but uh, that's the way the nation uh, considered a good way to, to man the fleet and defend the country. Uh, now, Jefferson, who's president of the United States, uh, decides that he's going to punish England. And by punishing England, he means that he is going to place embargoes against British goods so they can't sell to this country because we're a market for their goods as well. Uh, and so now it's, it's quid quo po, quo po. The, neither side uh, is able to trade with the other. And the people who are hurt, rather than the British, frankly, are the American merchants and farmers because they can't get their goods to say, out to, to sell in Europe. Uh, and uh, they can't buy goods that they need to uh, manufacture things with. So we're, we're, he, Jefferson really hurt the, the uh, average citizen as much as he has uh, the British. So now Jefferson uh, has an incident in 1807 uh, where the, the ship, the Chesapeake, which is an American man of war, and a British ship called the Leopard, uh, they uh, have a conflict off the coast of, of uh, Norfolk because the British ship decides that there are some British seamen on board. They attack the American ship as it's coming out of port. It's not prepared to fight. Uh, a number of people are killed and many are injured on board the American ship. They board the American ship, they take four sailors off. This really, really torques off Jefferson. And this goes on like that, and several other incidents, until uh, almost the end of his term and on into Madison's time, the next succeeding president. So finally, by 1812, this is getting worse and worse. And Jefferson goes to Madison and he says, you know, the taking of Canada this year is a mere matter of marching. We can really hurt the, the British by taking away Canada. And what he means by that is if, if one American soldier puts his foot across that Canadian border, he believed, Jefferson and Madison believed, that the French Canadians, who he thinks are, are disgruntled with British rule, because 80% of the people at that time in Lower and Upper Canada are of French origin, they will automatically rebel and kick the British out, and even, may even join with us and expand the United States. Who knows what could happen in that situation? But there's a problem. You see, Jefferson banks on the fact that Napoleon has been utterly successful from 1804 in particular on. And he thinks that there's no one in the world that can defeat Napoleon. And uh, you can see why he would say that, but he's wrong. What happens in 1812? In 1812, in the fall, Napoleon takes 500,000 men and he invades Russia. And by Christmas, he's on the way home with a little over 40,000 troops. The rest of them disintegrate in the Russian winter. And from then on, Napoleon begins to decline, in, to, in fact, until March of 1814, when he is finally forced uh, out of office. So this was not a good year for Jefferson to invade, or in, to, to invade Canada and to declare war on the British, but he did. The other reason it's not a good idea for Jefferson is that he hasn't got an army and a navy. You see, there's only 21 ships in the American army, or American navy, only 21 men of war. And then the largest, the, which are the four frigates, one of which is Constitution, uh, is only a fourth class vessel. There are three classes above it. And so she really uh, is, is not capable of, of the kind of warfare that you would think of when you, when you think of naval uh, engagements. In addition to that, he didn't have an army either. There's a very scattering of army troops that are left over from the Continental days uh, that are at, at port, uh, uh, fort facilities and so forth. And so he's got to build an army from scratch. And he's depending on the militia uh, to do that and then to pay some people to join the uh, regular army and, and virtually create a regular army for Madison. So this is not a good time to be doing these kinds of things. But uh, he is determined, and Madison is determined, 
And so in the summer, in the spring of June of 1812, the United States invades Canada. 